What in the world makes us so embarrassed about the gospel? I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Now, for this morning, uh, we want you to turn to Mark chapter 3 in, in your Scripture, run a little behind, uh, and I've got an awful lot to say, so be patient, and uh, we're going to try to unpack a really critical portion of Scripture, Mark chapter 3. And our text for this morning starts in verse 20 and uh, goes down to the end of the chapter. We did part one last time, and we'll come in on that in a little bit, and then we're going to do part two and kind of wrap it up this morning. The theme of this particular section is the unforgivable sin, the unforgivable sin. Now drop down to verse 28 for a moment and let's at least identify this as the core of our study this morning. Jesus is speaking here and He says, truly I say to you, by the way, that little formula, truly I say to you never appears in the book of Acts, never appears in the epistles of the New Testament. It only appears in the lips of Jesus. It seems to have been a phrase that He used uh, to identify something that had very significant meaning and was in fact a representation of divine truth that needed to be heard. Truly I say to you, all sins shall be forgiven the sons of men, and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness but is guilty of an eternal sin. Now it might strike you as strange that there would be a sin that would not be forgivable. Don't we say that uh, God offers forgiveness to sinners? Doesn't the gospel promise that the Lord will forgive all our sins, that He'll Pass by all our iniquities, isn't He a pardoning God who overlooks sin? Doesn't He bury it in the depths of the sea, remove it as far as the east is from the west and remember it no more? Isn't God gracious and merciful, as the prophet says, who is a pardoning God like you? When we preach the gospel, don't we say that God will forgive all your trespasses, all your sins? Now, doesn't this sort of contradict that? It doesn't contradict that, and I'll show you why, but it is a very serious passage to take to heart. It is in one sense a passage that ought to frighten the comfortable and comfort the frightened. Because on the one hand, there are people who have no idea that they have committed the unforgivable sin. They have no idea that they have committed the unforgivable sin. They're comfortable, and they ought to be frightened because they're headed for eternal hell. There are other people who think they've committed the unforgivable sin and haven't and need to be comforted. Through the years of my ministry, of course, I've met both kinds of people, the comfortable who ought to be frightened and the frightened who ought to be comfortable. Perhaps in our congregation today there are some of you who have the notion in your mind that somewhere along the line you blasphemed the Holy Spirit and it lingers in your thinking that you may never be able to be forgiven for that. Now, understanding in a simplistic way that you said something against the Holy Spirit, you are somehow beyond the hope of salvation. Maybe there are some of you who feel that somebody has told you that and laid that burden upon you, and there are others who think that maybe they've blasphemed the name of Jesus Christ, and, and in blaspheming the name of Jesus Christ and speaking against Him in some reviling way with calumny and, um, and uh, evil thinking and evil speaking, they're thus beyond the hope of forgiveness. Well, this morning the message has two objectives. One would be to frighten the comfortable and the other would be to comfort the frightened. Now let's look at it together. As we remember last week, the four gospels are written, all four of them, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, to leave irrefutable historical evidence that Jesus was God. While He was 100 percent a man, He was 100 percent God. He is God in human flesh. He is the Messiah of Israel. He is the Savior of the world, but all of that comes from the reality that He is the Lord God. He is God the Son. 
And that is important, that is critical, because believing that and committing your life to Christ is the only way to escape hell and enter heaven. There's only one way to escape eternal hell and enter eternal heaven, and that is by believing in Jesus Christ. There's no other way to be saved. The Bible makes that absolutely clear. The gospel is exclusive. It alone is the means of salvation. There is no other way. So it's pretty important then that you believe in Christ, and in order for you to believe in Christ savingly and entrust your time and eternity to Him, you have to have the evidence that He is who He claimed to be, and that evidence is presented to us not once, not twice, not three times, but four times in the Gospels. And then that evidence is interpreted for us in the rest of the New Testament all the way through to the book of Revelation. The evidence is powerful. It is powerful when it's inscripturated, and those of us who have come to believe have come to believe because of the power of the inscripturated record of the life and ministry of Christ. The evidence is laid down by the power and inspiration of the Holy Spirit in the pages of the New Testament, and we have read it, and we understand the truthfulness of it, and we embrace it as true, and thus we embrace Christ. The evidence is powerful, I say, even when inscripturated. But the evidence was powerful as well even when it was demonstrated, when it was lived out in the life and ministry of Jesus. For three years, Jesus traversed the land of Israel, starting His ministry down in Judea with the cleansing of the temple and uh, and doing teaching and miracles and wonders for the beginning year of His ministry in Judea. Then He moved to the north to Galilee. The bulk of His ministry was in Galilee and all across Galilee and even outside of Galilee into some of the surrounding regions. And then the final portion of His ministry, the last months, came back into Judea and went from town to town and village to village. Those three years He blanketed the land of Israel and gave evidence of who He was, more evidence than we have on the pages of the Gospels. Because John ends his gospel by saying, if everything that he said and did were to be written down, the books of the world couldn't contain it. We have stories of healings and stories of deliverances from demons and stories of raising the dead, and we have them scattered throughout the gospel record, but they don't begin to come close to the thousands upon thousands, if not tens of thousands of miracles that were being done by Jesus. And so periodically through the gospel record, you have statements uh, that are general, like he, he went on from village to village doing signs and wonders and miracles and delivering people from demons, and there's just no way to count it all up. And so the people who were living at that time were exposed to that, and he had a massive crowd of people following him everywhere he went. Sprinkled, of course, you remember, with the leaders of Israel, the Pharisees and the scribes, who collectively were responsible for basically the existent Judaism that was reigning over the minds and hearts of the people at the time. And they were following Jesus doggedly, not because they believed in Him, because they wanted to rather find ways to discredit Him in order that they might kill Him. But the only reasonable conclusion that an eyewitness should have to what he saw and what he heard would be that Jesus is God. The testimony was so clear and so obvious. However, in spite of what was reasonable, in spite of what was manifestly clear, in spite of the fact that people saw the miracles day after day after day after day, the human heart, the human mind is hard and blind and dead to the truth. And so here we are already at the end of the third chapter of Mark, and we haven't heard a human testimony that Jesus is God. The Father said it at His baptism, this is My beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. The demon said it in chapter 1, we know who you are on behalf of the rest of the demons. You're the Holy One of God. So testimony has been affirmed, but it is testimony from before, testimony from demons, testimony from the Eternal Father. So all the evidence is being mounted up. People have not made the right response. Some have. Jesus now has disciples, and out of the disciples He has twelve apostles, more intimately close to Him, who will be trained to preach the message of who He is. But most people haven't come to the right conclusion in spite of what they've seen, and they've seen it. They've seen it. They've experienced it. Most people would say, He's a good teacher. That's what they said. He's a man from God, because only a man from God could do these things. And that pretty much is what they said. He's a good teacher. He's a humble man. He's wise. He's compassionate. 
He delivers people from the horrendous oppression of disease. He delivers them from the terrible possession of demons. This is a good man. This is a model of virtue. This is a powerful man. He must be, he must be tapping into divine power. That's what they said, but they stopped there. Now, that would be pretty much the way it's been ever since. People say about Jesus, He's a good man, He's a wise man, He's a noble teacher, He's a model of virtue, He's a righteous man. That's pretty much what you hear. Even critics of Christianity, even enemies of Christianity, even atheists tend to put Jesus in the category of a sort of a misguided uh, spiritual revolutionary who came to help the poor and the oppressed and deliver people from their burdens. And even though they deny the miracles, they think He was making a noble effort to help people and thus He's a good man. But that's not an option. That is one option no one has because good people, wise people, sensible people don't say they are God. As soon as you say you are God, you have just eliminated yourself from the category of the normal, certainly from the category of the wise and sensible and reasonable and good because that is such an outlandish claim. When you say you are God, you have just eliminated the possibility for us to say you're a good teacher because that, that just doesn't fit into the category of good teaching. I told you that in the last century, C.S. Lewis, the great English writer, said, when Jesus claimed to be God, there were only three options. Either He is God or He is a lunatic or He is a liar pulling off a very, very grand scheme of deception. Those are the options. But you can't really come to Jesus with some patronizing nonsense about Him being a good teacher. As soon as somebody says they're God, they have left that category permanently. So we have some options. He is God, which would be the right option since He had power over disease, He had power over demons, and He had power over death. He raised dead people, He healed sick people, and He delivered people from demonic oppression. That's all an evidence of divine power which gives testimony to the fact that He is God. But if you're still fighting that in your heart, you have two other options. He is a lunatic. He's a crazy person, like other crazy people who say they're God. Or He is a liar who really pulled off a very deceptive scheme, in fact, so deceptive that we have Christianity today, 2,000 years later, still flourishing. So those are the options that C.S. Lewis put before us, and I kind of think he probably got them out of this passage. Now last week we looked at option number one, that Jesus is a lunatic, and we saw it in verses 20 and 21. Let's look at it. He came to a house, literally, in Capernaum probably, which was the headquarters of His Galilean ministry, maybe Peter's house. And the crowd gathered again to such an extent they couldn't even eat a meal. He is now collecting a massive crowd swelling crowd because they're bringing to Him all the sick and all the demon-possessed, everybody with issues, and they're, the people who are well are coming because they've never seen anything like this. Nothing has ever happened like this in the history of the world. And it's just collecting a massive crowd so great that Jesus is crushed. He, he can't even eat a meal. This is then dangerous to Him. And His family has gotten word about this. They heard about it. They're not there. They don't believe in Him. John 7, 5 says His family didn't believe in Him. His mother did, of course. Mary, she knew who He was from the time the angel gave her the announcement, and she knew she had never known a man and had a child by the Holy Spirit, so she knew who He was, believed in Him. Uh, he was clearly her Savior and her Lord. Uh, Joseph believed in Him because it was announced to him who he would be as well, and Joseph uh, probably is dead because he doesn't appear anywhere in the record of the New Testament Gospels. But, but the brothers and sisters and aunts and uncles and cousins did not. And it says here in verse 20 that they, or verse 21, that they, when they heard about it, what did they hear? They had heard about Jesus' exploits. They had heard that He was just collecting a massive crowd, numbering in the tens or twenties of thousands of people. They were crushing Him, and their determination was this. They went out to take custody of Him, for they were saying He's lost His senses. They conclude that He's a lunatic. They conclude that He's lost His mind, that He's insane. Now remember, they're in Nazareth. That's not a very far distance from Capernaum, but they aren't 
They aren't following Jesus. They don't believe in His claims. And keep in mind, the New Testament says He did no miracles in Nazareth because of their unbelief. He'd been there, but they tried to kill Him after one visit. So these people are operating with only hearsay, and they're hearing information about the fact that supposed healings and deliverances are happening and miracles are being done. They're not buying into it. They are not eyewitnesses to it. They haven't experienced it. Their conclusion is that this is the, this is the final expression of a very odd child. Now remember, he had brothers and sisters, clearly indicated to us in the New Testament. Their names are even given, James and Jude and Joseph, and he had sisters also. Now, they were born to Joseph and Mary, so Joseph lived a while during those thirty years, of the silent years of Jesus. They were having a family, and they were brothers and sisters, and they grew up with Jesus, and, uh, and Jesus is God in human flesh. So this little boy, this kid, this junior hire, this high schooler, this adult man is God in human flesh, which while he didn't show His deity, didn't do miracles, uh, didn't teach as far as we know. He was still sinless and perfect, and that would come across as very odd, would it not, in a family full of wretched sinners. It's tough enough to get along with your brothers and sisters without being perfect. That would rankle them endlessly. They would never be able to comprehend Him. They would never be able to understand Him. They would be blown away by every response that He had, which would be a perfect response measured against their imperfect reactions to everything. And so the conclusion they had was, this is a very bizarre child, and now he's gone totally off the deep end. So for the sake of the, the poor guy, we got to go rescue him. We need to go get him. So they made that determination. The word there, to take custody, means to seize, like in an arrest. It's used a number of times in, I think eight times in Mark, for arresting someone, including John the Baptist and Jesus. So they decide they're going to do that because he's lost his senses. Go down to verse 31, they come, they arrive. Mary comes because I think she, she knew the truth and she's there as a, a protective influence. And his brothers arrived and they're standing outside the house. They sent word to him and they called him. The crowd was sitting around him and they said to him, Behold, your mother and your brothers are outside looking for you. Answering them, he said, Who are my mother and my brothers? Wow. Is he ignorant? No. Of course he knows who they are. Not only that, He loves them. In fact, he, later on, they will come to believe in Him. Acts 1.14 says they'll believe in Him after the resurrection. They'll be a part of the first church. They'll be there on the day of Pentecost. So He loved them right into the kingdom, and He loved His mother because He committed her to John to care for her when He died on the cross. Well, it's not about that. What He is saying there is, look, the time for all human relationships to end has come. The only relationship to Me that matters is a spiritual one. So in a sense, He keeps them at a distance. It doesn't matter that you're related to Me through My mother. That, that carries no weight in the kingdom. That's not going to get you into the kingdom. Looking about those who were sitting around Him, He said, Behold My mother and My brothers. These are the people who are, have a true relationship to Me because they're the disciples and the followers who have committed themselves to Me in faith as their Lord and Messiah. For whoever does the will of God. He's my brother and sister and mother. There's no advantage in having a relationship to Jesus that is merely human, gains you nothing. The only relationship to Jesus that matters, he says, is the one that is spiritual. Listen to what he said in John 6, 40 about that. He said, he, here he says, whoever does the will of God, he's my brother, sister, and mother. He has a relationship to me. But in John 6, 40, this is the will of My Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in Him will have eternal life. What is the will of the Father? To behold the Son, to, that is to assess Him, to look at Him carefully, thoughtfully, believe in Him and receive eternal life. Jesus says, the people sitting around Me, some of them have done that. They have a relationship to Me. If your conclusion about Jesus is that He's a lunatic, you don't have a relationship to Him. You don't have a relationship to Him. The, the, the plus in this is that they were ignorant. They were ignorant. They were not first-hand eyewitnesses. They hadn't been there following, watching. So they were making their conclusion out of ignorance. They rejected his, Him as insane, taking all the things that were coming back to them as hearsay. And later on, they came to faith in Him. They came to believe in Him. 
because when they got the full information, the full revelation, they embraced Him. They did the right thing. So there are many people who might conclude that Jesus was insane, crazy, out of His mind, over the top, had a Messiah complex, thought He was the Savior of the world when He wasn't. That's forgivable because that might come from ignorance of the truth. The second possibility is that He's a liar. And that's the one we see in verse 22, and I want you to look at it. Verses 22 and following, the scribes. Now we move from His family to the scribes. They're the ones who decide that He's a liar. And the scribes who come down from Jerusalem. Now that's very important because now we got the big boys coming down from the center of authority in Israel, the city of Jerusalem. These are the elite. They start to show up. Now there have been, there are Pharisees and scribes that those are the theological brains, the, the brain trust of Judaism of the time, now, the ones responsible for designing it and propagating it. Uh, they're, they're after Jesus. They don't like His message. They don't like what He says. They don't like what He does. They want Him dead. They've already concluded that back in chapter 3. Just go back to verse 6. The Pharisees had already begun conspiring with the Herodians, another power group, as to how they might destroy Him. So they've made their conclusion. They want Him dead. They want Him out of the way. But He keeps going from town to town to town, and we, we saw that back early in the Gospel of Mark. He's, he's just ubiquitous. He's going everywhere all the time. In fact, in 128 it says, news about Him spread everywhere into all the surrounding district of Galilee. And, and everywhere He went, every village, every location, out in the, the countryside, everywhere He went, He was doing these miracles, making these claims, teaching this gospel of the kingdom gospel of salvation, and the leaders were there listening and reacting negatively. So finally the word gets to Jerusalem. Jerusalem sends some delegates. Uh, this, um, this shows that the brain trust, the elite, have weighed in on the fate of Jesus. Over in chapter 7, verse 1, the Pharisees and some of the scribes gathered around Him when they had come from Jerusalem, chapter 7. Finally they get Him back to Jerusalem, and that's where the same people come together and seal His fate, as it were, and have Him crucified by the Romans. So the heavyweights come down. They're coming with the party line, folks. This is not their personal opinion. This is the line that the Pharisees and the scribes have come to. They didn't just confront Him with this once. Matthew has a parallel passage to this, Matthew 12, 24 to 32, the same account. But Luke gives this account in Luke 11, 14 to 23 of a different occasion. Uh, this was in Galilee. The account in Luke is in Judea at a later time where the same ac accusation comes and the same conversation takes place. If you go back to uh, Matthew 9, 34, they said He did what He did by the power of Satan. Back to Matthew 10, 25, He reflects on the fact that they had said what He does, He does by the power of Satan. This is their mantra now, and they're propagating this with the people. So this is one of those occasions. We have at least two of them described, one by Matthew and Mark, the same one, and one by, by Luke. Now this conclusion can be far more sinister and spiritually fatal than the first one. Let's see what they said. They said this, they summed it up, He's possessed by Beelzebul. That's their final judgment, the final verdict on the evidence, the, the verdict on His teaching and the verdict on His miracles, he, He's possessed by Beelzebul. Now why don't they conclude that He's just insane? Because they have to explain the supernatural. Insanity doesn't explain, explain the supernatural, doesn't tell you anything. You only say that if you don't know that there's a supernatural element. Look, they knew that He had this massive power over demons. Demons were running amok out of the people that He would commanded them to leave. They knew He had power over disease. They had to explain the supernatural power, no getting around it. And it was either God or Satan because those are the only two supernatural persons who have that kind of power. God and His holy angels, Satan and His unholy angels. They're unwilling to say it's the power of God, which was the logical thing to say, which is what the sort of popular opinion was, and they had to change that. No man can do this except God be with him. But they had to make people think it was satanic, so that was their mantra. He's possessed by Beelzebul. 